Today, as we continue looking at the various, um, the, you know, the various uh, dicasteries, is the word, uh, groups of uh, people who are working on certain things within the church. For example, education. There's a dicastery for Catholic education. There's a dicastery for bishops and all. Um, also called congregations. So um, now a lot is happening, as we know. And, you know, we've seen the last few days stories in the paper and whatever on this uh, whole thing about the synod that is going on now in Rome. Um, and so, I mean, we can't have this going on in Rome and we just sort of, you know, ignore it. So we're going to today talk a little bit about one of those groups in Rome that is set up for the family. That is a group that is headed by an archbishop and their task for the last 30 years has been focusing on, uh, on you know, family. How can it be strengthened? How can it be supported? And so on and so forth. So today I'd like to just begin with that and then I think I'll take a little uh, time since we may have some questions or concern from what you've read in the papers or seen on television. The family, we know that the church from very early on has been pretty focused on what they've been saying based upon uh, two things. One is what is in scripture. You know, and, and, and uh, you know, you begin with uh, the book of Genesis. You know, a man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife and the two shall become his one. And that uh, this oneness is for the love of the two people and also the whole matter of procreation. And so that has been a very, very significant uh, a Catholic position. It's not new, and in fact, if anything, it is, you know, out of step with other groups, but it's been consistent from the beginning. So that this idea of what is marriage, what is family, what is the role of, you know, uh, two people coming together and their role in, uh, in procreation. That was carried on through the Middle Ages, and we have some very significant uh, you know, teachings of the church, not only at the Council of Trent, but also at the, uh, you know, the gathering that took place at the, uh, at the First Vatican Council. You know, there's a major document there, um, the church in the modern world, and there's a major section that are on you know married life now in fact they you know made some you know some um, you know uh, interpretations and about what constitutes the marriage a marriage is when people you know come together knowingly and all to enter into a lifelong uh, relationship because the Catholic Church is held, you know, from the beginning of the notion of indissolubility, that when two people come together, it's not just for a while, it's not as long as we like each other, that there is a, you know, a real commitment. And, and that's why those words that are said, you know, that I take you, Margaret, to have and to hold for richer, for poor, in sickness and health, and until death do us part. I mean, that's not just nice poetry. It, you know, it's not just a nice little sounding thing, but that's what the church actually holds. Now, no, not all Christians hold the same thing. You know, and I think we, you know, I mean, we know that. Um, and, 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 you know, it's not a debate. I mean, all we're trying to do today is to understand what our faith does, not to, you know, to pick a fight with someone else's faith, what they do. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not what we're living on about having, you know, a contest. 
It's what we believe. And I think that's a very important uh, point that that has to be where we're coming from. And, you know, you know because we are going to be judged on the integrity with which we live our faith. And that's what God is going to judge us on. It's interesting, Pius XI, he wrote a very important encyclical back in the 1920s. And in that, yeah, he said that a married person works their salvation through the way they live their vocation. It's not about what kind of a teacher you were or a truck driver. Those are what you did as a work, but that what is the most important thing for a person who is, who is married is how do they live their vocation with the person that they were married to. Because that is the more fundamental relationship that that couple has, not only with each other, but with God. It's not whether or not I was a good truck driver. Now, I'm not making light of that, but it's not on the same level. And I think we have to always keep that in mind, that marriage is not just one out of many things. No, marriage stands very solidly as the way that we interact, not only with our spouse, but with God himself. And that whole notion that I was married in the Lord is so fundamental to our Catholic understanding of marriage. That marriage is, in fact, the relationship sacramentally between two people in union with God. That's what makes the marriage indissoluble because God is a part of it. And we know that God does not go back on his commitments. God is, is giving himself to that union. And that is what makes that an indissoluble part. So that is what right now, you know, our Holy Father, and we have been doing this now for 30 years in the Catholic Church, that there's a special group that is only about, you know, families, the Council for Families. And the Church is under our leadership of, uh, of Pope Francis taking a hard look at, uh, at uh, the state of marriage and family life across the world. Now, it's not all the same interest. You know, what we as, say, Americans are, you know, bombarded with is the, you know, the challenge of, of being committed to a lifelong relationship. That's not a terribly big issue, maybe, in, in uh, Africa. The big concern there is polygamy. You know, that, you, know, the, you know, the issues change across the world because they have d different histories, uh, different cultures that they were part of, and now they're trying to, you know, to make it more and more authentic with the Catholic teaching. So that, you know, it's not like there's one problem and the entire world is focused on it. No, there's one reality the reality is marriage, but it's how it is lived out in different, in, in different countries that the church is trying to work with on all of them, not just the United States. I mean, we can tend to think that, you know, the United States, Western Europe, you know, the first world, that, you know, that's the only way to look at things. Well, it really isn't. And in fact, you know, there's a lot more people, you know, in the second world. And the third world is growing faster than any of us. So, but, you know, but we have, you know, the numbers of people. We also have, you know, the power of media and all of that that creates an impression that can be misleading as far as who and what constitutes the church throughout the world. 
And we can tend to see it through our own eyes, and it's really very different. Okay, let me t take a few minutes. Anyone want to say anything about family? Uh, maybe something that you heard on the radio or the TV, and something that you've been wondering about. You know, we're still going to hear a lot more about family because we have another gathering, which will be next year on the same topic, probably from different dimensions. But it'll be another, and in fact, it'll be longer. This year, it's only two weeks because it's an extraordinary synod. And this next one for next year is an ordinary synod, which will be three to four weeks. So we're going to hear a lot more about family. But does anyone want to say anything now? Yes, please. No one knows. It's an, an excellent question. The question was, you know, you know, this meeting that's going on, will there be decisions made now, or will this be a preliminary to the next synod next year? The Holy Father hasn't said. You know, it, 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 there could be some decisions. You know, it's kind of hard to make a big decision and then revisit it next year. You know, you know, but however, they can do you know, pretty much what they want. But it then becomes very confusing to people if you come out with a big decision, you know, and you get you know, all the newspapers and the reporters and everyone else, and then 13 months from now, well, you know, we're going to change that a bit. You know, so, I mean, I'm hoping that there isn't a, you know, I'd rather see that we wait myself. I mean, it just becomes confusing. You know, I hope this is preliminary and, and will be, you know, probably the foundation of what the next synod will begin with. But I, I don't have an inside, you know, uh, track. Yes. Well, the synod, the synod only gives recommendations to the Pope. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I mean, that's how the mechanism goes. Well, I mean, no, I mean, all they do is they, I, I mean, right now, they're in, you know, it's only a two-week synod. The first week, people talked and then started to have conversation. Um, what they're doing now is they're in the different language groups working together. Well, like the English-speaking world is here and the German world is there and so on. And what they're doing is they will come together at the end of this week, maybe into the real early part of next week, and they will then present what their considered thoughts and opinions are, and the Holy Father will then take all of that under his uh, you know, uh, guidance. And then going forward, he will at some time say something, and then that will become the next step. Now, the way you phrase it, you could say, I'm going to make one big, big, big decision, and the rest are just going to be still there in uh, process. So, I mean, you know, and he hasn't said exactly how and what will happen at what time. You know. It's one of the advantages of being Pope. You can decide that. <laughs> you know, there's no one else to tell you to do it another way. No. Okay. Okay. The other thing I would like to talk about just very briefly is a very important part of the church, and that is evangelization of people. Remember, the last evidence we have of Jesus' presence in the world was 40 days after Easter when he rose to the right hand of the Father. And the final thing that he said that has been recorded in the scriptures, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The final words, he, if he said anything else, no one has written it down. That's the last message. So what was he saying? He was saying, look it, 
I spent all this time preparing you to do something. And that doing something is to take this message to the world. Omnes gentes, all the nations. Go to all the nations and help people come to know and love me, Jesus is saying. And, and they did a pretty good job. I mean, today, when you think of it, one out of every six people in the United States and the world is a Roman Catholic. You know, I mean, they talk about China. I mean, what the heck? There's more Catholics than Chinese or Indians. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, really, the United States is the only, I mean, not the United States, excuse me, the Catholic Church is the only entity that is truly some, you know, is everywhere in the world. It's just the reality. Now, we still have more people to convert. Early on, the church had a certain group that they focused on just that task. I just want to say two things. One is, we as Americans benefited tremendously when they started to come to, first of all, was Florida, and then was in northern Maine, and then the English people came in the 1620s, and you began then to have, you know, Catholics in these various places. And they were supported. They were supported by the French, the Germans. They were supported with money. They were supported with priests and nuns, and they then began to spread the faith here in the United States. And then in 1908, Rome communicated with the United States and said, look at, you're no longer a mission country. You're done. Now it's your job to do it for other parts of the world. You relied on the French and the Germans to pick you up and get you going. And now what we're doing is we're saying to you, you are not a missionary country anymore. Your job is to get vocations, get money, and help other parts of the world that need to hear about Jesus Christ. So that was 1908. 1911, three years later, the American Foreign Missionary Association was started. It's known as Marinol. Marinol was the first group that was founded. It was first, it was priests, then it was women religious, and they have been at this since 1911. And where did they go? They went to China. They went to China. And then they went from China to Japan, and then they came, a, a number of them came into uh, you know, Africa. A very good friend of mine that I lived with for a number of years, he was older than I, but you know, he had come back from the missionary lands after 47 years in Tanzania. You know, and I mean, people just went, I met a nun, a, a, um, you know, a Marist sister. And she was having a birthday, and the nuns asked if I would come over and celebrate Mass. She was going to be 100. And she left for the missions in the South Pacific Islands, and she was there for 82 years and came home. Her parents died while she was gone. Her brothers and sisters were all dead. And you couldn't find a more peaceful woman and so happy the way she had lived her life. But it was that kind of generosity and, and giftedness that, you know, they had a, a, you know, a, um, you know, a vocation to be a missionary. And they did it. Extraordinary. So it was a real privilege to celebrate Mass with Sister. And she was still up and about and chattering. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, 82 years. I mean, she went off at 17 and came back, you know, 82 years later. 
I mean, that, that, I mean just, uh, you know, think of it, you know? And, and, you know, and all those people that had been part of your life, they were no longer. So you come back and, and, and everyone's a stranger to you. I mean, it's like going to another planet. And, and yet it was that kind of, of generosity and goodness and, and a real desire to help people come to know and love Christ. And they did it. They did it very well. But anyway, that is going to be celebrated, you know, here in, uh, you know, throughout the world, in October, World Mission Sunday. So when you hear that, when you go to church on Sunday, and, the, you know, the priest or a, uh, you know, a missionary is there to give a talk, that's what that's all about. The last words about Christ... People who, you know, answer the call of being a missionary, either men or women, and they have been and continuing to bring the message to others. That's what Christ said. Go therefore and teach all nations. And we're still doing it. I think that's a, an extraordinary, an extraordinary event when you think of it. And that's what I talk about when I do uh, confirmations that to these young people, not that they have to be a missionary going to South Pacific, but to have a missionary perspective that I need to pray for them, I need to support them, I need to be helping the cause because you are part of the, you know, of the church. You know, I mean, you know, it's not for me and you're excused from it. No, we're all part of it. You know, we really are. I mean, it doesn't make sense that I have something wonderful and other people don't. No, no. God is looking for all of us who have a relationship with God that we all make an effort in one way or another because every one of us has the different responsibilities in life and all of that. But every one of us, at least we can pray, if not, you know, financially help. Everyone is not called to go to Papua New Guinea. Just, I mean, all of us, I mean, we wouldn't fit. So, so we don't, you know, you know, so that's not on the travel brochure for us. But that doesn't mean we can't do things here. The person who is named the saint, the, the saint who is the patron of the mission, no, of the missions, is Sister Therese, the little flower. She never left the convent, but she loved extraordinary. And she was named by the Pope of being the patron saint of the mission. Never went to a mission. Died at the age, uh, age of 23. What was the Pope thinking of? Uh, didn't he know that she had stayed home in France? Of course he knew. But what was he trying to do? He was trying to send a message that you don't have to be there, you have to be concerned about there. And that's what he was trying to get people to buy into. It's not just that you go, it's that you are interested and committed to helping it. So here's this 23-year-old woman, dies, and the Pope is saying, you are the patroness of missions. You know, now, some clear-thinking American with his computer and all would say, oh, that made no sense. Well, yeah, but we're dealing with God. And it does make sense. God's ways are not our ways, is what Isaiah said. So anyway, okay, th the other thing that I also wanted very much to bring up today, and that is the issue around justice and peace. The Catholic Church, back in uh, 18, 1891, came out with a very important document entitled Rerum Novarum, of New Things. The Catholic Church paid great attention about, you know, about the Ten Commandments and talked about them. What do you do? You know, what don't you do? And all that. 
But in 1891, the Pope came out with a very important thing that it's not just my individual actions as a person. You know, I told a lie. I did this, I did that. But we also have a responsibility to the bigger picture peace and justice. And so starting, you know, at the end of that century, we then 40 years later had another do a document called uh, Anno Quadrissimo, 40 years after. I mean, we're real creative, you know? <laughs> I, mean, we're, I mean, we're wonderful about that. We really make it easy for them. And then we had Mater Magistra, and we had all these great documents, which the world not just the Catholic Church, they study him because it's about what do you do for a family or an individual about, you know, a just wage. I mean, that was the Catholic Church that came up with all that. You know, it was the Catholic Church when there were these terrible strikes, you know, you know the railroad strikes in the United States back in the 1800s. And the president would call upon the Bishop of Peoria, Illinois, Martin James Spaulding, and he would adjudicate the problem because we had a system. We had a way of figuring out the rights of people, what's fair, what's equitable. It was, it, you know, it's incredible what the church has, you know, brought up. I mean, you know, uh, the, the, this whole question of you know, of religious freedom, you know, and, you know, and, and, uh, and that in our country. The great person who did that, and then it went through the world, was John Courtney Murray, you know, a Jesuit who was, you know, a, a wrote a book, a simple book, We Hold These Truths, which is the underpinning of the, you know, the United Nations Declaration on you know, human rights. I mean, it, it, it's a fascinating story, but religious freedom and the whole question of justice and peace are at the very heart of what Rome is doing in those two areas. So we talked about the family. We also talked about uh, evangelization to peoples. And then thirdly, a little bit about peace and justice. Any one of those could be a course for a year, you know, in a college. They really could be. I mean, there's so much written. But at least it gives little snippets of what are these areas that the church is involved in, literally around the world.